All right, we're talking about faculty websites and I'm turning it over to Martha Burtis. Hey everybody, um, thanks for joining us today. I, um, I'm gonna share my screen. I put together some slides to um, kind of frame what I want to talk about. And I wanna just say, um, in the interest of transparency, like, so this workshop kind of grew out of a conversation in teams with um, the cluster pedagogy learning community. And um, there were a lot of different levels and kinds of interest about websites and using websites in that conversation on teams. And so um, the reality is that if I met with any of you individually, this could go in 18 different directions because there's so many different ways of approaching this work. But what I'm trying to do is just offer as holistic a view as possible of what some of the possibilities are. Um, but we can, uh, I'm going to talk maybe for, I'm hoping no more than 20, 25 minutes, and then we can open it up to a little bit more conversation. And as Robin said, happy to meet with anybody one on one who wants to talk more specifically about your needs, your, your, your situation in terms of your a personal website or a, a something for your courses. Um, this presentation is on Google Drive and that bit.ly link at the bottom, if you wanna follow along, you're welcome to do so. There are a couple of links in here. There's a bunch of resources at the end, um, but regardless, um, we'll be sharing all of this on the CoLab website on our resource page. I don't know if anybody else is just seeing a, black, a white line down the middle and black. Oh, I'm seeing that. Uh, is it better now? Yes. 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 That's fine. It was. I have two monitors, and I guess you'll just. I won't be looking at the camera because I had to put it on the other monitor. I don't know why. Technology is strange. Um, so your faculty website. Um, I don't even know where the title came from. I think Robin picked it, and it was like what, how, why, which is totally great. But I decided that I want to actually start with why, not what and how. Um, basically the question of why would you do this? What are the reasons why you would even consider um, bringing a website either into your own uh, professional practice um, as an academic or into your um, practice as an instructor and a teacher? Um, and I wanna start here because some of you may or may not be familiar with the larger context that we're, oper that we're kind of operating within um, with some of the, the, the tools and opportunities we have at Plymouth State. Um, uh, many years ago at my previous institution, I was part of starting a project there called Domain of One's Own, um, which basically allowed um, faculty, students, and staff within our community to get their own domain name and their own slice of an open source web server in which they could build whatever they wanted um, at that address, at that address that they chose. Um, and Domain of One's Own kind of took off both at Mary Washington, but it got picked up by a number of different institutions and um, adopted and absorbed into different cultures of those institutions. Here at PSU, we have something called Plymouth Create, which is a domain of one's own um, instantiation or installation um, that's available to our faculty, students, and staff. You may have heard of Plymouth Create. Um, sometimes we may call it domain of one's own as well because at core, that's where it started. These are four sort of, um, I did a presentation many years ago about Domain of One's Own, where I came up with these kind of four goals for Domain of One's Own, why, why it exists. So providing students with tools and technologies to build out a digital space of their own, um, letting them investigate and interrogate digital identity for themselves, um, providing curricular opportunities to use the web in meaningful ways, and that's something that we'll talk about um, in, in a lot more specificity today. And then pushing students to understand how the technologies that underpin the web work and how that impacts their lives. That's a lot, that's a really big scope. Um, and it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily, all of those don't necessarily align with your particular goals for your class or your interest in building a website for yourself or with or for your students. Um, but I wanna provide this context because I think it's important to position the work we do within that larger conversation. And the reality is that all of this has grown out of a much bigger conversation about the meaning of the web in the higher education and what our responsibilities are as educators to orient our students to the web um, and help them understand the web as a space of possibility and a space of publication. Um, and also what some of the pitfalls of being on the web can be um, in terms of working with students and in terms of our students living their lives on the web. Um, but so why websites? At its heart, Domain of One's Own and Plymouth Create um, are about building sites, um, building different kinds of websites. So one of which is one of the ones, like kind of models Robin talked about would be like a personal faculty website. 
this is about creating a home for yourself online and the distinction here would be one that a home for yourself that isn't linked um, or owned by some kind of commercial provider like Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. We all have different presences online to varying degrees depending on how active you are in social media and social networks. Um, this kind of website that we're talking about is divorced from that. Um, this is really about um, cordoning off your own space that you have control over and that you um, administer for yourself. Um, a course site is another thing you might be interested in. Robin also talked about this, which is really a place to share materials, assignments, updates, and potentially to co-create some knowledge with your students through blog posts or other kinds of things you might publish and share. Um, sometimes people talk about this in um, opposition to or in relation to the LMS, which it makes sense because we're familiar with what the LMS affords us. So we can talk a little bit about how this is different. Um, what's most different is that we're talking about public space, um, so we're not talking about something behind a password um, or that's gated off, um, but where students work and the things that you're sharing are not only available within your class, easily accessible on the web, but available to the larger web and part of that larger ecosystem of the public web. Then some people may be interested in this as well, which is the idea of students actually building their own sites. Um, having students have their own space to share, create, collaborate um, on the public web. Um, and related to that, um, project sites where um, it's not so much an individual student has a site, but maybe a group of students in a class or an entire class are working together on a public facing web project. Um, and so what we're looking at is how would you, how would you approach building a site for something like that? Um, for today, what I'm probably most focusing on is this second one, this notion of a course site. Um, but I'll be talking about these other practices as well. And obviously, like I said, we can, we can talk more in the Q&A and one-on-one -on -one as need be. So Kathy is my first example here, a personal faculty website. Um, I, was, I will just say I did a presentation about Domain of One's Own last year for CPLC and I was so new to the institution, it was impossible for me to use any examples from PSU. So I was so happy putting this together because all the examples are from PSU faculty students and um, students, which was really delightful. Um, so this is Kathy's um, personal, personal website. Um, it's really a professional space for her. She can talk more about this, I'm sure, if people have questions at the end. It's at kathyleblanc.com. The kinds of things you would find in a space like this, you might find biographical information. You might find prof actual professional work, professional product research that you're publishing on your web space, whether in the form of papers that you've published, artwork, um, any other kinds of um, sort of artifacts of yourself as a researcher, as an academic, and as a, a, a teacher. Um, you might also find teaching information. So in Kathy's um, site, for example, she actually links to off to some of her courses. Um, and so you can find out a little bit more about her as a teacher, what her uh, pedagogy is. Uh, very frequently you'll see something you know just on a practical level someone's cv listed on their professional site and then of course because of the kinds of tools that we're using for this you can also this doesn't need to be a static space where you just post it and leave it um, there are tools in all of these um, applications to build websites to do things like updates and news and blog posts so that you can keep um, keep your space sort of um, vibrant and a reflection of whatever you're working on at the particular moment you're thinking about um, a course site is a little different. Um, this is the IDS Senior Seminar um, course site, um, which actually lives on the CoLabs website, um, but this is Matt's course website from this spring. Um, and it really is a, um, a portal, so to speak, for the course um, with links to syllabus. Um, resources. I mean, this is a, a, a really practical level. It's the same thing as, you know, what the LMS gives you, you know, giving students a piece of paper with URLs on it is a not terribly useful thing. Here you really can link off to various um, resources or um, stuff that you want students to look at. You can also bring some of that stuff in by embedding media um, that maybe you're having students work with or um, respond to. Assignment descriptions and again things like updates, announcements. This can be a really emergent space. This can be a really fluid space. Um, you can um, go in and very easily, if, you, if the class sort of takes a new direction or 
um, if you have some part of the class that um, emerges out of conversation with the students, like they're picking topics or um, focus for, for particular weeks, that's easy to modify and edit and um, reshape the space as need be. This is a different course site. This is one of Kathy's. I wanted to point this out because this actually has a slightly different um, um, inflection to it, which is that it's more about student. This is kind of a group blog for students where students are sharing their work. Um, so Matt's course, this one, this is Matt's site. He uses this to share stuff with students. So it's a resource for students. This site of Kathy's, which is linked to her climate change or was linked to her climate change course, was a space she set up where every student was an author. I'm assuming that's the case. Um, and they were able to um, write posts in here about the work that they were doing and the research they were doing. Um, one other thing I want to mention, and this gets back to Becky's question and, um, and what Robin was saying earlier about building a course site like this. I, at this point, I, I've taught fully online, but I haven't done that for a number of years. Um, but when, at this point, m part of my practice as an instructor when I'm, I'm getting ready to teach in a class um, is to build a course website, always, even if it's a, a completely face-to-face -face class. Um, and it be has become a really valuable instructional design practice for me. Um, because going through the process of having to think about structure and architecture of information for a website very closely resembles in many ways going through the process of thinking about the, um, the kind of the rhythm and sequence of a course and how you want students to engage with material. You really have to be thinking about structure, both um, the structure, kind of the, 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 intellectual structure of the course in order to create a version of that, a web version of that for a course website. And that doesn't mean that it needs to be entirely locked down. Like I said, I tend to teach classes in a fairly emergent way. So I build into them um, the possibility for, for constantly revising and editing the, the way the course is going to go. But it does force me to really think carefully about what I want the overall environment and structure of that course to look like and then how, how I want to have that reflected in a website for students. Um, and then the last one here is a student site. This is one of our students in IDS, um, Chantel, who did an IDS major in marketing for sustainable practices. Student sites, this, is, this would be a site that they own, they manage and create, design. Um, very often, we think of these as portfolio sites where students might be sharing their best work, their best projects. So I have here an italics final. So with an emphasis on product and, and final, um, final pieces, but there's also, and there's lots of great practices around the idea of having students use these sites as process oriented spaces, particularly through blogging where students are writing blog posts and sharing blog posts that um, are sort of meta narratives of their learning um, and their thinking about the work that they're doing. I do that a lot with my students when I teach digital storytelling, um, which has a huge component where students are making cool things and sharing their great media work, but also a really big component of students narrating and talking about process. Um, this also can be on a practical level where students quote unquote submit their work to you by sharing it on their website. Um, but it also becomes a place for students to um, craft their own digital identity and start thinking about their home on the web and what they want that to look like, particularly post-graduation or when they're looking for internships, future jobs, applying to graduate schools. So students very often, as they, if they start with this early in their college career, as they're graduating, they start thinking about things like putting up their own CV or resume, their own bio, social media integration with Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram and beginning to craft for themselves their own digital identity, which in many ways is their version of this faculty website. Um, and then, oh, there was one more. So this is the project site. This is a course site, uh, a project site that came out of a graduate course that Amy V taught this past spring um, in environmental um, science. It's a watersheds class. Um, and I love this. I unfortunately can't share the link for this because it's still password protected, but I'm sure she'd be happy to show it to people if they're interested in seeing more. This was a really cool project where the students built this website. Um, it was kind of cool because I've talked in the past about um, websites as a tool for project-based learning. Um, 
and basically the website becoming the place the, one of the places where students are grappling with the emergence of the project so they they really had to determine what should the overall architecture of information be what kind of content do we need to gather they had to switch um gears when things didn't work out quite right but it's really a place for shared student work collaborative design and and thinking about information ar architecture and again lots of pbl possibilities there so what are the options on a practical level about how you might do this work? Um, so there's a couple of different options. Um, some people are really familiar with some of the free commercial hosting that's out there. Um, this is bad because my animations didn't work. So I'll just show everything and talk through it. So some of the free commercial options, we have things like wordpress.com. People have heard of things like Wix or Weebly, maybe you've heard of commercials for them, <laughs> places like Squarespace. Um, so these are companies that are offering free um, web space where you can build a website or a blog. Um, but often you're still paying for it. Either you're paying by having ads served on your website or you're paying because you're essentially giving up your data um, to be used in particular ways to sell ads. Um, you have some limited options and control in these spaces. So not, or you have to pay to get more options and more control. Um, and they tend not to be as portable because if you ever wanted to move your site out of Wix, for example, there's no way to export that content. You literally just have to go in and copy and paste stuff to move it from one platform to another. The one exception to this is WordPress.com, which is built on the WordPress um, content management system and WordPress out of the box has um, import and export functionality. So you can move from WordPress.com to a self-hosted WordPress site somewhere else and port your content pretty easily. Um, Plymouth Create Hosting is what we offer through our Domain of One's Own project. Um, basically, like I said, you get to pick a URL. Here at PSU, it would be something.plymouthcreate.net. You would pick that something piece. Um, and then we give you space on a web server where you can install any a number of applications from a long list of open source apps. The most popular one by far at every school that I know of that does to make one's own is WordPress. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that that I can get into if people have questions. Um, because this is a Plymouth, Plymouth Create is a PSU um, offering, it's PSU hosted and supported. Um, you have mostly complete control over it. So you're installing WordPress. That means you're the system administrator for it. You determine what plugins, what themes are available. That also means you have mostly complete responsibility for it. So you're responsible for doing updates um, for, for because if you don't do that, there's a chance your site will get hacked. Um, so you have a, you have a little bit more responsibility, but the, the, the payoff is that you really get to do whatever you want there. And the content in all of these applications tends to be very portable because we're building on an open source framework. And the last one that I'll just mention here is personal hosting, which isn't really personal. You're not running a server necessarily out of your like home, um, but you'd be working with, you'd be choosing a commercial provider that you're going to pay money to them. Um, in that, what are the advantages to that? One of the things is you get your own URL. So like Kathy's um, website was, I think, kathyleblanc.com. Um, that's because she's going, I think that's because she's going through her own hosting um, company that she's chosen. You can still install those open source apps, but you have to choose and pay for the hosting. You have complete control and complete responsibility and still you have lots of portability. Um, but for our purposes, what I'm really focusing on is Plymouth Create in many ways, because that's our institutional space where you can kind of at least get your feet under you um, in terms of working in these spaces. If you've never done it before, you have some support for it, um, both through the CoLab, but also through academic tech. Um, so then the next question would be, how would you go about doing this or teaching this? Um, so this is the most important step, and Robin already mentioned this. I would never, ever recommend that if you have never built a website before um, and are wholly uncomfortable with the idea of building a website, that you launch a huge project this fall with your students having them build websites. Um, because it's not that you can't be successful doing that, but it's going to be a pretty tough challenge. Um, working on the web in this particular way as kind of you're the owner of your own site is you kind of have to develop some new digital literacies and even digital fluencies around the work and around the applications that you're going to be using. So if you're interested in this, you should go ahead and get yourself a site on Plymouth Create. 
um, and you should start learning how it works. These are just screenshots. You don't, if you decide not to use Plymouth Create, these are the back ends of Wix and WordPress.com and Weebly. So if you really feel strongly that you want to use something else, that's fine. You can go off and explore and experiment with those. But the reality is, bottom line, is you're not really going to know what's possible until you yourself experience it, start to play with it, experiment, um, and see what you find out. So that's always going to be the first step that I'm going to recommend to faculty. Um, and very often, as Robin said, what it starts with is you really focus on building your own site um, and seeing what that what affordances that offers to you. What is that? How does that ch change your mindset about sharing your work, about publishing your work? What sort of connections do you start seeing emerge? Um, and from there, what I've often find fa found working with faculty is it's a kind of hop, skip, and jump from realizing the value of that to you as a practitioner in your discipline and as, as a professor to understanding how that could be relevant and important to your students or relevant or important to the work of teaching. Um, so starting with something that really feels personally relevant and then branching out from there into exploring how that could become an important practice in other aspects of your lives or for other people who you work with. Um, and step three, choose what you want to do and create. So you want to build a course site to share resources if that's really your focus and emphasize you need to think about creating and digitizing resources you want to share you need to grapple with organization and structure um, i always recommend that you plan and build as much as possible but for course sites as i've said leaving some room for emergence leaving some room to switch things up as the course develops and as <laughs> as we saw this past spring <laughs> as unexpected situations arise, um, your website really can be a tool for you to communicate with your students um, and help assist them um, as things change. Um, if you're interested in having students blog and share their work, um, so decide if students need to work individually together, think about guidelines and requirements for the kind of work you want them to do, come up with a plan to orient and support your students. This is really important. I'm happy to talk to people more about this. Um, I have very strong feelings about the best way to go about supporting students through this work. Um, determine how you're gonna track the work that they're doing if they're working online. If it's a group blog, that's pretty easy because you can just go in and see what's new. But if you've got 25 students in a class and you're having them all blog in different places, now you've got to figure out how to keep track of the latest thing that they've done um and i can talk about that a little bit because that can quickly become overwhelming and i have some thoughts about that as well um and then this is important figure out how you pull that work into class so i've worked with faculty in the past who sometimes are like okay i'm gonna have my students blog between classes they'll do readings and they'll blog about it and then they never do anything to pull those reflections into the conversation that's happening when the class is meeting and so students as you know are not stupid <laughs> they very quickly realize that that work and the effort they're putting into it doesn't feel like it's going anywhere it feels like it's it just feels like busy work at that point so thinking about like how can you take those um the, those things that they're putting out there that work that putting there out there and pull it into the meaningful engagement and community of the class um, and that usually means a little bit of a lift for faculty in terms of curating and mining what students are writing or sharing or creating um, and relating it to and connecting it to other things that maybe you're working on together. And then if you're interested in having students maybe create a re resource together, same thing, you gotta think about guidelines and requirements, responsibilities and roles, schedules, check-ins, milestones, it's just like, overseeing any group project. Um, but most importantly is coming up with that plan to orient and support students because different than maybe doing a PowerPoint together, your students may never have built a website. Um, and now they have to figure out how to do it together. And so figuring out how you are gonna support that and, and what resources you have at PSU to help you do that. Another reason why you being comfortable within whatever tool you're having your students work with becomes really important. It doesn't mean you have to know everything. I mean, I still learn. I've been working with WordPress for like 14 years and I still learn new things about it. Um, but it does mean that you need to feel confident about your ability to figure things out um, or confident about your ability to find someone who can help you figure stuff out. Um, and then this last slide is just a bunch of resources that I've pulled together. There's so many great resources out there. I try to really balance um, balance a lot of different things in here. So some of these are some blog posts and um, 
presentations that myself and others have done about domain of one's own and about working on the web. Um, but we also have some stuff in here. The WordPress scavenger hunt, for example, is something that I created a few years ago that I still tend to try and use. Um, and it gets at this idea of supporting students, which is that I'm a really firm believer when it comes to having students work in this space that what you shouldn't do is spend a class where everybody steps through in lockstep. This is how we create a post. Now everybody write a title, add some text. This is how we add an image. Now everybody upload an image. This is how we add a kind of, the problem with that kind of instrumental um, approach to this is that students tend to just follow the steps, but not really absorb what they're doing um, and, and what the impact, what the meaning of those steps is. So the approach that I tend to take now is to send students out to work in a space like WordPress with some challenges. Like I want this group to figure out how do you embed a video in a post or a page? And I want this group to figure out how you would create a menu on WordPress and this group to figure out um, how you'd add featured images. And I don't really tell them much about what any of that means. I just kind of tell them to play with stuff until they figure it out and then report back and share what they've learned. Um, and I found that that's a really effective way of getting students to have to grapple with the technology themselves so that it kind of makes those connections in their brain that are going to be a lot more um, resilient connections when they're home on a Sunday night trying to figure things out than if you had just taken them through 15 steps in class. Um, a couple other things I'll just point out here. Sarah Parrish kindly let me share this. This is She has a style guide that she gives to students in her class about blog posts. So that's a really great resource if you're interested in how to guide students more about how do we blog? Like, what should your approach to be? That's a great starting place. Um, this tool parade one, I'll just mention this and then I'll stop. Um, this is a thing that I've done for years. We do it as part of um, Digital Pedagogy Lab, which is a, a faculty development program that I've taught with for a number of years. Um, and the idea behind tool parade is basically orienting people to the amazing array of web-based tools for communicating and sharing information. Um, and the reason I mention this is it's really easy when you kind of start out with this to say, okay, this is about building websites. So we have to learn how to write blog posts and share media and how to work with WordPress. But ultimately what we're doing here is we're positioning students with on, within and on the open web. And so helping them to understand that the boundaries of that um, web space are fluid um, and that information, they can pull other things in um, and they can share other things out is really important. And so this tool parade links to a Google Doc um, that Jesse Stommel and I and others have used um, that just is kind of a laundry list of web-based tools for doing stuff. And I very frequent, frequently in classes where I'm having students do this work will either do this tool parade for them or I'll have them do a version of it where I assign a different tool to each of them and then they have to investigate and share it. So it's things like um, Timeline JS, which allows you to create interactive timelines on a, on a web page. Um, Story Map JS, which allows you to create um, kind of map-based narratives with media embedded, um, tools that allow you to um, nav uh, like annotate video. So maybe they have a YouTube video, but they want to add like in line during the video questions and answers that people can respond to and reflect on um, during the video. Those are not building a website. Those are doing other things, but your, your web page, whether it's yours, your courses, or your students can become a portal to share all of that other kind of rich um, communicative activity that students can get can engage with on the web. So I recommend thinking about like what are some of the other pieces of the web that you could pull into the class and, and help students use um, either as part of a course site or their own websites. And I'm going to stop at that. We have about 20 minutes left. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen so that we can see each other again. Um, and invite people to ask any questions. I see there's been a little bit of conversation um, in the chat, but I haven't been watching it. So feel free if anybody wants to ask me anything. I might take a stab at a private question. I won't reveal who it's from, even though I don't think the person cares. But um, 
It is an interesting one about like, if you're working on your own stuff, what are the pros and cons of Plymouth Create? Yeah. And I just love that question. And Martha probably has more to say about it. And I also just want to point out that the pros and like, we could talk for hours and hours about pros and cons. Yeah. Um, but I, so my website, like a bunch of people here is built with Reclaim Hosting, a, comp a private company. But it's interesting because they're the same company that make Plymouth Create. So why do I choose to buy my website for 30 bucks a year when I could have my Plymouth Create site for free? This may be indelicate of me, but I will tell you why. Um, number one, I don't want Plymouth Create in my website URL. I want to be robinderosa.net um, because I see my professional life as being bigger than just my job at Plymouth State. So for me, I wanted a URL that reflected that. Um, I also wanted to have complete control over my own website. And even though um, Plymouth Create, like we don't have uh, too much back end policy that says, like, if Brandon writes something offensive on his Plymouth Create, we will do this, we will do that. But I was aware that publishing under Plymouth Create made me feel like I was somehow attached to Plymouth State. And sometimes with the work I was doing, I might be critical of Plymouth State, or I might be really speaking in a way that I feel like the institution would not speak the same way. So I wanted to have my own site. Certainly if I was doing a project for a Plymouth State course, I would completely choose a Plymouth Create site because I would want Plymouth to be part of it. I would want it to see that it's a course that's reflected. Um, but I think it's a very personal question. The other thing I suggest is if you don't know what it's like to work on the web, do start with something free. Um, hi, Pam. Bye, Pam. Um, so Plymouth Create can be a nice free way to experiment. If it turns out it's not your cup of tea, you didn't lose anything, you can delete it and be done. But if you like it, you can easily migrate that content to a site that you pay for. Um, you don't manually have to do that. It's very simple. So I do suggest starting with a free platform unless you're totally sure you're going to love it because why pay until you're, until you're sure. Can I, can I add a reason for why to pay for your own site? I have been blogging for years. We used to have at Plymouth, I can't remember now even what the URL was, but it was like, my URL was like cleblank.blogs.plymouth.edu, something like that. It went away. And so then I moved to wordpress.com and whatever my URL was. And, and then I wanted to get rid of ads. And, you know, so every time I moved my site, I had to update anybody who was following me because the URL changed. So I finally just decided I just need to spend the 30 bucks a year to, to have my own site. It's easy to transfer the content, but getting people to know that you have a new, new URL isn't as easy. I will say from a technical standpoint, it is actually possible within Plymouth Create, if you go out and register a domain name through just a, a domain registrar, you, you can use that on Plymouth Create. You can, um, it's called an add-on domain. Yep. But I think probably getting back to what Robin was saying and Kathy may be on the same page. I, I host, I have my own website with my own URL. I could just do an add-on on Plymouth Create. Um, but I also feel kind of strongly like my web space is my web space. It relates to the work that I do at PSU or that I did at UMW, but it's actually a lot bigger than that and a lot more than that. And I never wanted that. Um, I never wanted that to seem murky. <laughs> I just wanted that to be a really clear delineation. Um, but I think that that's a personal choice. I think for, for some people that that isn't as much of a concern or a complication. And I think that's totally fine too. You're muted. <laughs> if you wanted to build like, you know, an ETC site or a site for, um, you know, an environmental science course that you were teaching or a project that maybe spans multiple courses that different professors and students are going to work on. Um, or if you were certain that you were just going to host syllabi and you're a full time faculty member who's likely to stay at Plymouth. Those would be all be terrific reasons to choose Plymouth Create, I think. Were there any other questions from the chat that needed to be? Um, 
There was just a question about Wix. I think we got that. Nope, I think that's it. Um, feel free to unmute if you have questions. Um, there's not too many of us here, so you can just ask anything you have if you've got, I don't, and we're got about 10 minutes left. Yeah, this is Lisa. Um, I tried to do this actually just two days ago. And I got as far as managing to stumble through creating my own Plymouth Create site. And then I was like, okay, now what do I do? And so I kind of stumbled into where the apps are. And then I looked at the more apps and there's like 60 choices. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do with any of them. <laughs> so one of the links in the, um, in the resources in the slideshow is to PSU's Plymouth Create Knowledge Base. Um, and there, there is kind of a getting started guide there that'll walk you through installing WordPress, which is usually where I would tell people start. That list of apps can be super overwhelming. There's a lot. And I've, I've played with like 15 of them. <laughs> I do not know all of them. Um, but for the most part, the reason I tend to recommend WordPress is that it's incredibly versatile. So most of those apps, if you look at them, are, they're all for creating websites and some of them are highly specific, the kind of website you want to create. So some of them are for creating like an online calendar or an online file sharing site or um, a site for surveys or forms. Um, WordPress, if you play around with it enough and learn to trick it out, can kind of do any of those things. Um, so it really can be kind of a foundational platform that you build other stuff on top of. It's incredibly flexible. The estimates these days is that WordPress runs something like 35 to 40% of the world's websites. So the other thing I really like to emphasize is that people, um, if you, if you orient your students to WordPress, this is actually like a really great marketable skill for them to know WordPress because lots and lots of organizations and companies use WordPress. But for you building your own website, it also means there's lots of online resources. There's, lot, there's a great community of support. There's lots of us who use it at PSU. So what I would probably recommend, Lisa, is going through that um, installation of WordPress process and see where that lands you. And then once you're in WordPress, I think most people who've used it before can say it's, I mean, it's a lot, but it's pretty intuitive, like to know what, as you work, start working with things, you can kind of see how stuff works, but we certainly could meet one-on-one -on -one and I could kind of walk you through stuff as well. That, thank you. It, that's actually really helpful to understand what all these other categories are. Yeah. yeah. Different applications of the web. Yeah. Material. Thanks. I also want to put in a plug. Um, it's, it's kind of a bummer this summer just because of the emergency budget situation that we lost the student workers, but um, we definitely know for sure that they'll be back for the fall because Martha has a team of what we call docs, digital and open um, consultants. And these are a pod of students who are specially trained to work with faculty and other students on exactly this. So they can sit right next to you, either on Zoom or in the CoLab, and help you get everything up and running. We can do this too. So we're at Martha, make an appointment, we can do it. Um, but if for some reason you don't get started until fall, um, it's also a great use of student labor because um, they're really good at at walking each other through this and they can definitely walk you through it as well. Um, yeah. The other thing we can do is let's say you want to build a website for a particular class project. You want students to blog um, and write about, you know, trees on campus. I'm just thinking about Mary Ann's projects, whatever. We can assign you a specific doc, um, either that comes from Martha's team that she's trained, or like what we did for the art department is we trained their student workers um, to have the skills they needed on certain kinds of technology to work with their faculty and students. So we can also do that. So you could kind of have a student co-pilot on a project or a web thing. And that's especially good if you're someone who knows this stuff is really important and you want to do it, but you don't really care to get in the weeds of the tech yourself. The students are happy to be drivers of that stuff. And um, to a certain degree, they can, they can run a lot of that for you if they're in touch with us. It's also really um, a good, we should mention too, that our colleagues in academic tech, um, 
you know, Plymouth Create technically is an IT system. And so they've got folks in academic tech who regularly run workshops on Plymouth Create and WordPress and are also a great resource um, for some of the more technical um, concerns or questions. Yeah, you may know um, Erica Rydberg. So she is the name you should know. She's on furlough right now. I think I can say that because she publicly said it. I don't know. <laughs> but um, but she's kind of like the tech uh, back end tech person. Martha also does that stuff, but Martha's more about working with you guys. But Erica would be a person who, if you had trouble with something or um, couldn't figure out a thing, once she comes back in um, late July, I think, uh, she'll be another person on, on the Plymouth Create stuff who can really help you. Um, we also do have some webinars um, on Plymouth Create and stuff that I can dig out as well. Um, some older stuff. Um, and Martha's got some students also working on some updated documentation that I think is really nice too. Um, so hopefully we'll have lots of stuff available yeah, that's for you. A project that got sort of sidelined by yeah. the pivot, but hopefully this fall we will get back to it. Yeah, I would suggest that if you're interested in building a website, either for a project, a course, or you professionally, um, your next step would be think about the options, try to learn what you can from some of the um, links that are out there, and then make an appointment with uh, Martha. If you want to just weigh out your options, maybe make a half hour appointment and then a later hour another time to actually build it. Or if you're ready to build now, just make that hour long appointment. And you guys can, um, by the time you leave that hour, I guarantee you can have a website with the ability to do some very basic things on it. Um, the other thing is if you're super advanced and you've already got this set up for yourself, um, Martha can also help you look at some of those other apps and some of that other stuff um, that might be helpful if you want to do a different kind of project or something on your site that um, she's kind of a queen of me saying like, hey, I need the page to do this. And then she'll find the right, what we call sort of plugins or um, sort of add on stuff uh, to help design it. So if you tell her what your pedagogical aims are and your scholarly aims are, she can help you identify the tools that might help you. Hi, uh, this is Mike. I just have a quick question. Um, so if you build a website um, and you put all the information, like if I use my uh, desktop to build a website for my office, can I come home and edit that website, add more content to it and access all that information um, from my laptop at home? Or yeah, does it so have to be from the same computer? No, so the, um, so the applications that you're installing on Plymouth Create, they're, it's software, it's a program, but it doesn't live on your computer, it lives on the web server in the, in the slice of the web server that we've given you. So um, you, you interact with it entirely through a browser interface, kind of like filling out forms to create posts or pages or uploading files. Um, so that's one of the great things about it is you can work on it from anywhere with um, a device that's connected to the internet. I use my phone regularly to do stuff yeah. on the website. Okay. Yeah, and WordPress actually has an app for, um, for phones that allows you to do a lot of, uh, you can connect it to your WordPress site and allows you to do a lot of work on your site right from your phone or iPad. Okay, because I used to use the, the old Apple website building yep. thing. Yep. And the website, essentially all the information lived on my desktop yep. in my office through Jupyter. And yep. I couldn't do anything from home. So if I wanted to change anything, update anything, it'd have to be in my office. And um, so with Plymouth Create and WordPress, that's not yeah, a problem. It's all, it's all online. It's, um, a, it's a different model for, for web development that's kind of emerged in the last 10 or 15 years, not using desktop applications to build and push content, but to actually just work directly on the web server using um, an application that allows you to do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I, could, I could ask another one. Great. Uh, um, I'm still pondering this business of 
what Kathy does, which is has her URL direct people to a Plymouth Create site versus what you and Robin do, which seems not exactly the same because your websites don't live at Plymouth Create. Is that correct? I don't think Kathy's yours does, doesn't either, does it? No, my, mine is hosted at Plymouth Create. So if you actually typed, you actually typed in kathyleblanc.plymouthcreate.net, you'd get to my website, yep. but I purchased through Reclaim Hosting, purchased the domain name, and it is a redirect. Yeah, so it's basically, um, so when you buy um, a, a domain name, which by the way, you don't buy them, you rent them, you pay for them on a yearly basis. But when you purchase one, you tell um, the company you're purchasing it from where the website lives that that domain name should point to. So you actually purchase just the domain name and then the hosting is through PSU. And when you purchase the domain name, you tell the registrar, hey, anytime somebody types that URL in, point them to this space on uh, Plymouth Create's server. And this so, is confusing because sometimes like my dad will go out and buy a domain name and then he's like, where's my website? You know, and it's like you just you just bought a sign, but now you need a place to hang it by the house to pay separately sometimes <laughs> yeah. for that. You know, that's that ho actual house to put your sign on. So. Kathy, you bought the. Hosting, not just the name. Well, no, because I, I get free no. hosting through Plymouth Create. That's that's just about like who owns the computer where the content lives. And the address, you have to have that registered with the group that registers those. So what I did was I did that through Reclaim Hosting, but it my my actual content lives on PSU's version of Domain of One's Own. And that's like fancy right you don't if you want you can just get everything for free through plymouth create exactly and it will be becky noel dot plymouth you know rebecca noel dot plymouth create dot net and that's all free if you just want that and the only you reason want the I, custom url right the only reason i wanted the custom url is because i know i'm retiring soon and i'm not going to want to have to ch change everybody's not that no she doesn't what? I don't what you like about? <laughs> but i don't want to have to i've i've gone through enough url changes yeah. over the years i don't want to have to do that again so every you know so it'll be really easy for me to move my content from psu to reclaim hosting which is an awesome company and their response time for everything is is amazing and, and our students are sometimes bummed out because um, they'll work with us. They'll have their domain, johnsmith.plymouthcreate.net. And then they graduate and they're going to take their website with them. So they're going to pay now for a name and some hosting, but they can't get johnsmith.net. That's not <laughs> available. So they end up with whatever. Because um, at Plymouth, you can get almost anything you want with Plymouth Create in it. But on the real internet, you have to see what's available, right? And sometimes the thing you want isn't exactly available. So you'll have to deal with, with that. Yeah, I'm gonna need some. So well, Becky, another option with what um, Robin and I do, it, which is different than what Kathy does, is we both have not just our domains registered through Reclaim Hosting, but we purchase hosting through them as well. Yeah. We don't use Plymouth Create at all. We pay more money to reclaim hosting, not just registration money, but hosting money on an annual basis. And that gives us complete um, separation from the institution. Yeah, I'm going to need some one-on-one -on -one consultation <laughs> eventually, but I bought just my name.com. Um, I bought two, I bought my name.com and my book title.com. Nice. Um, and I also have Rebecca Noel, it's got an R. Rebecca Arnell, PlymouthCreate.net. And I was starting to build that out. And then I started to get confused about where I wanted to put my energies and whether I want to have two different ones or one direct to the other in which direction. So I'm going to need some help. And there's like, a couple untangling. different options. There's, there's a couple different options we can talk through whether or not you want to have different sites at those different addresses or you want them to essentially be um, like one mask the other so that it's right. one site, but people can get to it through either URL. And be, both of those things are possible. 
Yeah. I'm actually going to interrupt to say that my next meeting starts at four, oh, which yeah, does you not know. mean you people have to leave. I don't think, but it does mean I have to stop recording. So I'm going to do that now.